that. If you need me home, I'll blow off the rest of the trip and I'll just drive straight home. And that's not impossible. I'll just drive back out to Arizona for students to interview and I'll just I'll just make do. All the stress is not good for you, it's not good for the baby, and I don't want you to be in this constant upheaval of stress. So tell me what you want me to do. If you want me to blow off the rest of the trip, I will do that. I will drive straight home. I'll be there in a few days. So it just keeps raining. This is the second hurricane I've had to deal with on this trip. And the stress that I was feeling this morning is just kind of really gone through the roof at this point. If I haven't mentioned it by now, I have a pregnant wife at home and she is done with me being gone. And with almost a full three weeks into the trip and I just made the turnaround point, I had to call her and tell her that one of my interviews, my last and most important interview, just got pushed back from a Friday to a Monday, extending the trip an additional three days. She didn't take it well, she hung up on me, and now I gotta deal with this rain. I don't know. I'm just really starting to question what the point of this is. So. Mile marker 4,701. When we were assigned to Mosul, we had a kind of a, a rough spell of a, I'd call it a, you know, kind of a three to five day deal. There's a lot of small things sort of added up to one big thing. You shook up. I think we're rock down, man. What's that? What's the Because after that engagement at the combat outpost and the, uh, the unfortunate civilian casualty that we, not too long after, were hit by a roadside bomb. Now, First Lieutenant Pete Chacon just got rocked by a bomb placed on the side of the road. The door Lieutenant Chacon was driving in. When we deployed over to, to, to Iraq, armored Humvees weren't a thing. When the threat evolved into the roadside bomb, and we started debating, well, you know, how are we gonna combat that? What do we have that's going to stop it? The sandbags force protection measure right there. Seemed to work out. All the debris and shrapnel from the blast. My name is Rob Delaney. I am a retired Army officer. I did 21 years in the United States Army. My first 10 years as a enlisted soldier, a non-commissioned officer in the 75th Ranger Regiment. Lieutenant Chacon is just being told that he shouldn't go on this mission, Pandora 3, because he was wounded the other night in the IED accident, or explosion. Italian had a local news team embedded with our unit, and you know their job was to report on what we were doing, where we were doing it, and be able to tell that story back home. I mean, obviously, that's a good thing because that time in early 2000s, there wasn't a lot of methods for you know what we were doing and what uh, soldiers were doing for that message to get back to the family members. And so he should be coming up to me in a minute and telling me that he needs to go on a mission. They wanted some footage. So they left me with a, a small handheld, you know, Sony kind of camera. I thought you weren't supposed to be going on this mission. Huh? Got a really bare bones block of instruction from the photojournalist. And, you know, hey, this is how you work it. This is how you, you shoot, and this is what you should do um, to make sure that the footage that I was able to get was, was quality and they could use it to help continue to tell our story um, back home. Three, six, three, six, Romeo, Regional, I got my RTO trained so well that he just radio checks in his sleep. Travel vlog. Tomorrow hitting the road for a 7,000 mile journey over three and a half weeks, give or take a few days. Uh, and this is my mobile command center. 
end of August, beginning of September. Packed up, ready to go. They say life is a journey, and it's not about the destination. They say to live a great story. My name's Corey Rowe, and this is our story. The story of veterans in America today. I served with Bravo Company, 2nd Battalion of the 187th Infantry Regiment out of the 101st. That's me in the back. My unit invaded Afghanistan and Iraq back when the wars just started. Things were a bit different back then. But today, when I try to catch up with my friends, from no matter the tour, nor the cycle, the story is always pretty much the same. I feel like I'm gonna be a voice through this that shows people the human stories and the humans behind the word veteran and behind the term PTSD. I wanna show the human lives and the human side of the, the real cost of our deployments into Afghanistan and Iraq. I wanna show people that the effects, whether someone came home or not, are forever. All right, so this is for record keeping purposes only. I'm just kind of interested in, in filming a little bit of behind the scenes stuff, talking to you, my camera friend, as I travel across the country. Being able to talk and communicate is essential in combat. Corey Rowe had a bit of a reputation for not necessarily doing the right thing, you know, that probably needed a bit of direction. But from a technical perspective, I wanted somebody who, you know, was carrying a radio that I was expected to talk on when I push the button, that the thing was gonna work. Along the way, I'm gonna stop and interview uh, former members of the military, speak to some specialists about post-traumatic stress disorder, and try to get a handle on life in America for veterans today. The reason that I wanted to do, I think, this whole thing was so that I could give people some sound advice from the stories that I've gone through. Some of the people that I wanna go catch up with are no longer with us. And one of those stories is one that I've really wanted to tell, which is about my friend Jesse Snyder. Two men were arrested after police found a drug operation and possible bomb-making materials in a home near Cutler in Carroll County. 27-year-old Jesse Snyder is being held on felony charges. Officers located 25 firearms in the Snyder residence. The Indiana Homeland Security hazardous materials team was also called in to the 17-acre property. Snyder is a former Army soldier and current postal worker. Police say his motive is unclear. Over 5,900 rounds of ammunition, cases of assault rifle and handgun magazines. Homemade C4, which is an explosive material, two pipe bombs, and a military site for a tow missile launcher. According to court records, the FBI and the ATF executed the search warrant along with local authorities. Charges include nine felonies and three misdemeanors. Here is a look at what Jesse Snyder is facing from the Carroll County prosecutor. Possession of a destructive device, possession of a machine gun, dealing and possession of marijuana. Travel vlog on the road, about 200 Something miles in, just uh, east of Palm Springs, I'm in the arid desert between California and Arizona. Popping off some quick shots with the camera so I can get the diversity of our country as I cross it. Here we go, 7,000 miles, day one, coming at you from the middle of nowhere. My first stop was Phoenix, where I met up with two of Jesse's lifelong friends who grew up with him in Indiana. I still visit Jesse at his grave. I go back and I swing through the cemetery because it's out in my neck of the woods and I stop by and say, you dumbass, man, I miss you. The way I look back at it is kind of that idyllic middle America kind of an upbringing, as I recall. It was the days before cell phones and really before, I mean, there was internet, but by and large, it was the days before internet. It was, it was a lot of fun. You know, I grew up out in the country, about 80 acres with a creek and a pond and a bunch of woods and it was, it was a lot of fun. I would say a great way to grow up. Certainly look back very fondly at that. I met him the first day of kindergarten. I got in trouble with him for the first time, the first day of kindergarten, and been friends ever since. I met Jesse on the bus, and I was having a conversation with a guy in my class about uh, you know the typical junior high Indiana boy conversation. I wanted a 45 someday, my friend wanted a nine millimeter someday, and, and Jesse happened to be in the seat in front of me and he kind of popped up and turned around and, and said, 
you got to go with the with the 45 for the man stopping ability. There's four out of five with the laser. Two touching and two by the side. Could you see it? Could you see the laser? Fuck yeah. Oh hell yeah. You know, guns are my thing, but Jesse's thing was really guns. If he knew anything about a gun, he knew everything about a gun. There's some of the things we're shooting today. Jesse was a gun guy. He was always a gun guy. I met him over a gun conversation, and much of the time we spent together was out in the woods, shooting and... Getting ready to go shooting. Hang on, right where? On the water. Okay, hang on. Okay. Eight millimeter Mauser, spinning eye. Jesus. I met Jesse in Iraq. When we got home, we used to go up to his cabin on the Wabash. This is, what is this, Jesse? Oh, wait, never mind. Seven, down Bulgarian bullpup. Shoot guns and hang out. 75 round drum. Correct. A Romanian 75 round. Pull down the lever. You got to pull down the lever. Jesse taught me more about guns than the Army did. The lever? The safety? Did they? That would probably help. He also taught me how to be safe with them. This is a little door knocker. Beaver Lodge. This is a eviction notice. A lot of people from little towns across America joined the military as a chance to get out and see part of the world and have some opportunity. And I, I think a lot of that was what he was looking for, too. <laughs> and there's the smoke creeping across the water. I guess that's where it must have been sitting. He initially was doing well. He got a job at the post office, which I think he loved. It was it suited his style quite a bit. And, um, but then the next thing I know, I, I'm hearing essentially, I probably was contacted by 10 people. Said, hey, did you hear about Jesse? Did you, did you hear? What's, what's the story? What's going on with Jesse? What, what happened? What happened? PTSD comes in many forms. And while it may seem unique case by case, overall, each story reveals a common theme. Grew up in Safford, Arizona. It's a kind of a small town in southeastern Arizona. You know, I had a great family life. You know, in high school, I was kind of the all-American kid. You know, I was an Eagle Scout award recipient. I was the captain on the football and basketball teams. I had some offers to play at some small colleges and stuff. And I had a friend that was killed in Iraq that I grew up with and graduated with. And it kind of opened my eyes to what was going on in the world. And coming from a military family, and my, my dad served in Vietnam, both of my grandpas served in Korea. It kind of was just, you know, a thing where I was like, I really want to go and, and serve my country. And that's what I did. I was in the psychological warfare, so I was attached to a third group special forces team. I ended up going to Afghanistan twice. And I loved my job. I was, you know, lived out in the village, got to grow my beard and, and wear civilian clothes and stuff like that. It was, it was just cool, cool thing to do. I loved the people of Afghanistan. I loved helping them. The places where we were at, the Taliban was just very, I don't know, they were, it was their strongholds. It was, it was safe havens for them. And so we were clashing all the time and fighting a lot. And, um, lost some friends, had some very close calls throughout the 18 months that I was there. I'm Paula Schnur, and I'm the executive director of the National Center for PTSD. I'm Rachel Stewart. I am a former VA psychologist. I was trained at the White River Junction VA in Vermont with the National Center for PTSD Executive Division. What we're trying to do is put the best information wherever it needs to be. So for you, as an individual veteran deciding do you want treatment? Do you even have PTSD? We want to offer something to you. You know, if we weren't in Afghanistan, we were back home doing permission training to go to Afghanistan. And so from that first tour, when lots of things happened, you know, I never had time to kind of decompress and think about what was happening. I was right back over there. The second tour was, was probably even worse. PTSD is a disorder that can happen to people when they've experienced a traumatic event, such as being deployed to a war zone, a car accident, a sexual assault. It really is a set of problems that overall affects someone's quality of life and their functioning. So their ability to work, their ability to have healthy relationships, and their ability to have the life that they want. 
When I came back after that second time, I had had a back injury. The army prescribed me opiates and I knew that I had some issues. I was actually diagnosed with PTSD at Fort Bragg. And after, the, after you get that kind of diagnosis in the military, you know, your career is pretty much over anyway. And so I, I decided to just, to just get out after enlistment and come back home. I, obviously I was using Oxycontin for the physical pain, for the emotional pain, and my tolerance was growing higher, so I didn't have what I needed. So I was ended up, you know, buying some pills on the street from friends that I had grown up with or whatever. And, you know, I had been gone for four or five years, so I really didn't know the layout of, of everything in Safford. And I ended up having some, some friends call me that I had grown up with. They said, hey, you know, I know you know where to get some pills. Can you help us out? And I, I thought, yeah, you know, I can, I'm going to go get pills for myself, so why don't I just help you out, you know? And they ended up being confidential informants for the police department. Got home in April of 2011 here in Safford, and within three months, I got charged with five different cells of a narcotic drug. There's a whole opioid epidemic going on, not just in veterans, but across the nation, across the world. Sometimes these substance abuse problems take on a life of their own. Uh, that, that they, and you can develop physical addiction for some substances as well. And so PTSD might have helped initiate the disorder, but it's no longer the only thing maintaining. When you have post-traumatic stress, you really want to not feel what you're feeling. You also don't want to think about what your mind is thinking about. You also don't want to be triggered. You don't want to not be sleeping. You don't want to have anger and irritability throughout the day. You don't want your nervous system to be triggered into fight or flight mode. After the, the arrest and everything that, you know, for, for about two years after that, I, I had went to heroin and I was, you know, I was shooting $200 a day of heroin. And I have a scar on my arm from it. Um, at that time, I didn't have any veins anymore to shoot up, so I'd have to just muscle the, the shot or whatever. You know, not even getting high, just getting well, living in Phoenix, living on my brother's, my older brother's couch, and just kind of, you know, doing what I could to survive, really. And that was because I went to the VA, tried to get an appointment in Phoenix at the time that was the scandal going on with the Phoenix VA. Uh, it was actually before the scandal broke, so I was one of those veterans that got put on the secret waiting list. Veterans Affairs Secretary Eric Shinseki was in the hot seat on Capitol Hill today, facing tough questions from lawmakers investigating allegations that veterans may have died while awaiting treatment at a VA hospital in Phoenix. And this is a Fox News alert. At least 40 United States veterans have died while waiting for medical appointments at the Phoenix Veterans Affairs Hospital in Arizona. And according to reports, many of the men were placed on a secret waiting list and were forced to wait months to see a doctor. So I went and said, you know, I, I need some help, you know. And they said, okay, your appointment, the closest appointment we have is six months from now. So I went back six months later after, you know, my life had kind of just spiraled downward into heroin and everything. And they said, oh, we don't have any record of, of an appointment for you. 40 veterans may have died while on a secret waiting list for primary care appointments at a Phoenix VA. And now lawmakers are demanding answers. But hospital director Sharon Hellman denies knowing anything, saying no secret waiting list has been identified internally. We still have not seen the list of the 40 deaths. We have not seen these documents. So I had to wait an additional three months. So it was nine months in, the, in that nine months. I mean, by the grace of God, I, I was alive because I had friends that were overdosing and dying. And, you know, it was just, it was a horrible, horrible time. Okay, so let's see, today is my third day on the road. End of the third day on the road, I've gone a thousand miles. I've done three interviews. I drove from Los Angeles to, to Phoenix, and in Phoenix I interviewed Corey and Steve, who were friends of Jesse Snyder, uh, who we'll talk more about. And from there I drove to Safford this morning and uh, interviewed Chris Taylor, and Chris Taylor was just a jaw-dropping interview. Mile marker 731. I'm about to leave Arizona. I'm in 
southeastern Arizona. Just left my interview from this morning. A special operations guy who went through the ringer. Man, it's it's really gonna be an exciting story. I'm really looking forward to putting this together. But uh, headed towards Oklahoma. Just living the dream. I love the road. So I'm backing up the footage, charging batteries, uh, drying out the cooler. All right, I'm gonna get back to work, backing up these files. And there's my call. Oh, hold on. I left the arid deserts of the Southwest and journeyed on further northeast, towards Miami, Oklahoma. It was time to start checking in on the guys from my old unit, the Rakasans. I've been going powwows since I was little. Uh, started out at powwows. We usually camp, and everyone that's here that I've known all, most of my life, or all my life, we don't call each other friend. We call each other brother or cousin, mom and dad, uh, auntie, uncle. We're all, all related in some way, even if it's just by what we call Indian way. We're at Ottawa Powwow Grounds in Ottawa County outside of Miami. Oklahoma. We're at a, a powwow. It's, it's kind of a celebration that we as Indians or Native Americans do. We camp out and we have a song sang. And tonight they'll be, they'll do the gourd dance, which is a veteran's dance. And then after that, they'll do a war dance. And that's where all the feathers and the fancy dancing comes out and everything. I'm, I'm proud of my service. I'm proud of the first time I was in, and I'm glad that I went back in, because I met some great guys. We went to combat together, and I'm proud to call him my brother. One of the things people don't realize per, per capita, the Indians have the highest number of natives that go into the military per capita out of you know non-Indian, blacks, Mexicans. Because for us, we've been, we've been fighting for this country since day one. And it's considered an honor to be able to fight for this country. Woodrow Green Feather. I was raised in this, this area that we are, are in now, Ottawa County, Oklahoma. Graduated in 91. I really didn't know what I wanted to do with life. I went and started being an EMT. From the EMT, I went to being a firefighter. From firefighter, I went to being a police officer. Started out right out of high school at 17 years old did uh, a bunch of time in the Marine Corps. My full-time gig was as a cop. Did a brief period of time on patrol and wound up going to a multi-jurisdictional narcotics unit. Two and a half years uh, as an undercover agent. Bought dope and guns and... My name's Alicio Castillo, everybody called me Lee. Wound up going back to active duty. Wound up with the 101st Airborne at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And even though I was a cop and I was on the front lines at that time, I, uh, I just felt like I could be doing more. So I got to Fort Campbell on September 9th, 2001. My name is Joseph Boyd from Hermitage, Pennsylvania. I signed up for the Army, I think I was 19. Two months later, 9-11 happened. And 9-11 happened. So I went back in the Army. Uh, I got to choose where I went, which was 101st. From there, I went to 3rd Brigade, 187 Rockasons. <laughs> I got to the Rockasons. Great, great bunch of guys. You know, wonderful guys. Still keep in touch with them more than I do anybody else. Hard-nosed grunts that got the job done. From a reputation standpoint, the Rockasons are considered to be a very, very good unit. Ready with the red. Show the red. Stand to door. Ready with the green. Show the green. Go! One of the most famous and, and hardest uh, infantry battalions in the Army. The most deployed conventional unit they have. Rock saw means falling umbrella man in Japanese. 
and this, their symbol, the Tory. The Rockinsons are very proud of that symbol. You see it a lot um, around Fort Campbell and on their uniforms, and it, it just shows up in a lot of places. Yeah, they have a lot of combat knowledge behind them because it's been, you know, wars kind of never stop. They just haven't. They'll always be there. There'll always be a need for the Rock Suns. Mile marker 2350. I'm in Fort Campbell, Kentucky, at my old base here at the Rock Suns. I'm underneath the giant Tory here, a couple of gravestones. That one is my squad leader. This is my fellow RTO right there, Yates. And this is where I grew up. It is really weird to be back here. I'm not entirely sure how I feel about it. This is the Rock Hassan headquarters where I used to train. I lived here for four years, well, two years, two years overseas. Nerve wracking. I don't miss this place, but I miss this place. You know, we were first conventional troops to go Task Force Rock Hassan. We got there in uh, January of 02. I think I was at Fort Campbell for about a week, and then we went to Afghanistan. First one I ever rode, I think it was about three weeks, basically into the Army. And we did a mission in Tukaust, Afghanistan. There was three birds, I was in the last bird. And it went down hard and flipped for about a half a mile, quarter mile, something like that. It was pretty brutal. And then I woke up and people were pretty mangled on fire. It was a wreck. Throughout 18 months of being outside the wire all, all the time, I had lots of, of engagements, but one in particular, after the sun came up, we got into this area where I remember seeing the, it was just a very beautiful apricot orchard and the, it was in May, so the, the flowers had bloomed and everything. And I remember walking through and as soon as all of the element was in the orchard, we just got lit up. Whenever we get into a firefight like that, we know that we have to hold on long enough for the JTAC to call and get close air support. They ain't alive no more. I knew in my mind, because I had been in it before, just kind of hold on until that happens. And the problem was the, the JTAC, the Air Force guy who talks to the airplanes, it was his first mission, first time he'd ever been in combat. And so he froze up. The jets came on station and nobody was there to talk to him. I think that that feeling when I hear the A-10s or whatever they were up overhead, I know that, all right, we're gonna, I'm gonna survive this because they're gonna lay down all kinds of firepower and we're gonna get out of here, you know? And so when that didn't happen, when I had that feeling of like, yes, you know, I'm gonna overcome this, and then realizing that nobody's talking to the, to the jets, they have to leave without dropping any ordinance. That feeling of despair was just so overwhelming because my interpreter was here in front of me, bleeding out. Some commandos were next to me that were shot. You know, it was just chaos. We don't know with any sufficient precision who's going to develop PTSD. People who've been in combat automatically are assessing threat wherever they go. So I think it's day eight on my trip so far. I'm in uh, mid-Virginia. I've gone 3,183 miles so far, uh, done seven or eight interviews on this trip. And it's raining really bad for the second day. Uh, I wanted to pull over for a few minutes and just kind of see if it could slow down. Uh, part of a hurricane kind of worked its way up to this section of the country and kind of feel like it's been my own personal rain cloud for the last couple days. Starting to get tired. 
not even to the halfway point yet and uh, don't seem to have enough time between stops to rest. I got probably four or five more stops till I'm at my midway point and where I'm starting to work my way back. So I just want to do this quick check-in. Get back. Get back to driving. All right, that's enough for now. I work at a cornstarch factory. It's a Tate Mile. I pack starch. It's put starch in a bag and or a rail car and or a semi. The suspects, 27-year-old Jesse Snyder and 28-year-old Justin Erty, face felony drug charges. My name is Justin Matthew Erty. Well, I still have a nickname. They call me the Unabomber. <laughs> and everybody knows who I am in the whole plant. Uh, there's uh, soft nuts. <laughs> well, I'm not liking that row. Mark, you be filming me. I am from Manchester, Connecticut, and I'm a professional shirt folder. Are we ready for battle yet? Oh, we're fucking ready. Assholes and elbows, boys. <laughs> yeah, me and Snyder were always right next to each other, like the for everything. So that was, that happened fast. Like, oh, you like guns? I like guns. That seems cool. All right. Came to hang out with my buddies, you know, get some good old fashioned times down, do a little shooting, some paintball, hang out, drink some beer. He's hilarious too. He has a sixth sense of humor like me. That's probably why we bonded so quick. That night, okay, we played paintball. Still recording. Oh, hello. Far again. picture guy too so we were constantly like hey you know same picture just you know reversed or whatever we were both big on the pictures I was expecting literally some shit out of Forrest Gump and it was <laughs> it just was it was crazy and intense but I didn't mind the long walks for no freaking reason and getting up and getting yelled at and just working out and it was fun like bah, I got on the fucking ground we were looking for Omar, man. You had to find Omar. Omar wasn't there. Grew up not too far from here, Manchester, next town over. Played hockey in high school and off to the army. Did you do any exploring at the Baghdad airports? Of course. Oh my God, that was awesome. It's more of that chaos moments where you just, just tunnels for miles. Here's a big piece of poop I found. I took a picture of it because it's so massive, it's impressive. <laughs> I'd never fucking left New England. Never. Like, we, we went, we had never, I'd, I'd never been to Disney, never been anywhere. I wanna go somewhere, I wanna do something. That's what I wanted to do, literally. <laughs> Plain and simple. In the garage over there, playing paintball, we were using fireworks to signify the start of the round. And uh, after about hour of playing, sure as hell the man shows up. Got to be about midnight, one o'clock, I don't remember. I got tired, went in the house just to go to sleep. Cops come, we're in full battle route, paintball stuff. Come out back here just to, you know, figure his misunderstanding of sorts. Laid on the couch for a while, you know, and I hear the dog start whimpering, and so I get up, let out. I forgot about how long after a bag, you know, we were there playing paintball. And in comes the, you know, the cops rush in for no fucking reason. Oh, we gotta call your poaching, which turned out to be bullshit. They're just bored and heard fucking fireworks going off. Get the signal at the start of the round. Still recording. Oh, hello. Uh, far again. Twenty-eight-year-old Jesse Snyder was arrested in October of 2007 on charges of marijuana possession, possession of machine guns, and bomb-making materials. We're good to go, we're rolling, sounds right. good. One more time, can you give me your full name? Jesse Wayne Snyder, 28 years old, uh, served in Iraq in the infantry during the invasion, avid gun enthusiast, first rifle when I was five, probably 22, first pistol when I was nine, 
nine shot 22 uh, high standard sentinel it's been off ever since then this is snyder attempting the same can i did with his own weapon which is zero to him and he missed and he missed again and he missed the third time and he missed again is it as easy as you thought huh yeah, I was in the infantry, uh, signed up for five and a half years, airborne infantry unassigned. I actually ended up at Fort Campbell. Okay, go. It's hard with the G3. I had some friends in from the army. Got that Tabasco in or mm -hmm. something? Yeah. yeah, why not? Next thing you know, tack lights, pistols. Flashlights in my face, I had no idea. I thought they were paintball guns, but when I opened the door, I realized they were real guns. So then it was, you know, step out, hands up, all that. So we walked in front of them, gun still drawn as we're walking. Tells everyone to come out. Everyone comes out from behind the barn. They get them all on line, you know, cross feet, hands above the head, all on line, administering breathalyzer tests to the people that are underage. And mind you, this was all on private property. You know, they had no right to do any of this. They violated everyone's civil liberties while they were here. Uh, even the judge said that. Circuit Judge Don Curry has ruled that evidence collected by police cannot be used against Snyder. A DNR officer and Carroll County Sheriff's deputies went to Snyder's property on County Road 400 South near Cutler to investigate shots fired and complaints of illegal deer poaching in the area. He was parked down here watching us with binoculars for two and a half hours. Well, right, down the, right down the street? Right, right down here. What? I don't know how. Pulled right in there. He he pulled out, that's where he was sitting? Yep. That's where he was sitting. When I was walking out, I was like, oh man, this is pretty serious. At first I was like, no big deal. Then when I seen maybe eight to 10 people, I don't remember how many people were here, on their hands and knees with their, you know, on their knees with their hands behind their head, I was like, man, what's going on? Well, we're basically sitting here like this, like this for a good half an hour to 45 minutes while they take us one by one. In his decision, Judge Curry found there was nothing about their conduct, nor had any officer witnessed any criminal activity that would justify citizens being ordered about their private property at gunpoint. He's got uh, Jesse, who lives here, because uh, they, you know, they, they found whatever. Uh, they pretty much have him in handcuffs at the time. You know, pretty much searched the place, found a big thing of pot. Charged with nine felonies and three misdemeanors, ranging from Dealing in marijuana, which is not a, I was growing marijuana. I wasn't dealing it, it was for my own personal use. It was, it went, I wasn't dealing it. That's the bottom line. Destructive devices, pipe bombs, which was a empty pipe with caps on it. You could go to Menards, you go to Hardware Island, do the same thing. Grab two end caps, screwed on a threaded pipe on each end, and that's not a bomb. It has to have an explosive material to be a bomb. They eventually found a pipe in the van and they got the, they got it out and then they arrested me. Said I was under arrest for paraphernalia, evidently. The judge also ruled warrants obtained later were based on inaccurate information and any evidence seized during the search is in Carroll County Prosecutor Tricia Thompson says she's reviewing the options. This victory for local law enforcement and media quickly turned into their darkest nightmare. As the case was overturned and the judge ordered all of Jesse's firearms returned to him, every pistol, every rifle, every bullet, and even the cannon. The decision was made to drop all charges on 28-year-old Jesse Snyder. Carroll Circuit Judge Don Curry ruled in April that warrants used to search Schneider's property were obtained under inaccurate information. As a result of that ruling, Thompson filed a motion to dismiss the case due to insufficient evidence. Thompson has filed a notice of appeal to gain the evidence back. 28-year-old Justin Erdy was also arrested. He faces a misdemeanor charge of possession of paraphernalia. You know, you still have rights in this country, you just have to pay for them. The media had a heyday with it, especially the, the local news reports. Oh, I'm disappointed with the newspapers and the news and 
how they tried to over exaggerate this and make it sound so much worse than what it really was. They didn't even respect, they lied in the reports and that kind of thing. They didn't respect his service to the military. They just made me out to be someone I'm not. Yeah, I like guns, probably more than the average person, but it doesn't make me a bad person. And I do believe that Jesse should really get his job back. It's been almost a year now, and they have no grounds for firing him. Back like I'm some terrorist, which couldn't be further from the truth. He had a good job, too. I think he worked with the post office. He lost his job. And it was just horrible for him. He just fucking terrible. That really hurt him. It was kind of a kind of a, a message from the post office that we don't believe you, we don't trust you, we don't like you. He had gone into foreclosure and lost his home. And at that point, you know, I think he lost a lot of hope in that moment. It's pretty much ruined my life for shoddy police work. I mean, there's those times in your life that things happen and you know from the rest of your life there on out, it's not gonna ever gonna be the same. And that's one of these cases. On News Channel 18, news from where you live. Travel vlog, mile marker 3851. I am leaving New London, Connecticut on a ferry across the uh, Long Island Sound to go to Eastport, New York, meet up with a Vietnam veteran and who happens to be my uncle. So uh, yeah, take a little boat ride today. Journey continues. They couldn't get ammunition into Wei or Dong Ha because the road was mined. There was only one road went in called Highway 1, and they were blowing the choppers up. So they sent us in with 180 ton of live ammo. Battle speed, as fast as we could go, is six knots. 180 ton of live ammo sitting on the deck. I was a, a river rat in the United States Army. When I got into the city of Wei, the first trip, they were loading two and a half ton trucks, deuce and a half, with dead American bodies. And they were coming across the river in sandpans hanging out of them, and they were just hoisting them. Japan surrendered. When the Second World War people came back, they came back as heroes, wherever they were. And so, you know, they were credited with what they had done. But they came back as units and they mostly came back on ships. And they had what they called out mustering pay. So they didn't just come back and, and the next day they were out. They came back and they were declassified. They, were, they, they went as a group. They could, they could explain to one another, they could talk to one another about their experience, what had happened, how they felt, where they were going. In Vietnam, you were there one day and you were here the next day. My name's Lawrence Keating. I'm a clinical social worker. I'm in private practice now. Just developed in Vietnam, because when the guys came back, they didn't assimilate well, as I didn't assimilate well. And so if they came back and they were still in the military and they didn't assimilate well, then they got a bad paper discharge. Different. I wasn't used to, I guess, barracks mode. And it was fucking stupid and pointless half the times. Like, all right, you guys have nothing to do. Go clean your weapons for like eight hours. I'm like, all right, cool, PT, yay. You know, I still like the, the fun aspect of it, going out and training, you know, shoot houses, blah, 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 blah. But I don't know what the heck happened. This is what happened to uh, tons of Vietnam veterans. They came back, they were still in the military, they got in trouble. They get in trouble, how come? Well, because they don't assimilate. Well, if you have that kind of an experience, it's very difficult to just go from one thing to the next. You know, worked up just thinking about it. It was terrible. I'm either worrying about my leg or my back and fucking my ear that still rings to this goddamn day. There's nothing anyone can do. Sleep at night is, has been hard. Like, unless I either drank myself to sleep, spoke myself to sleep, I could be up till four or five in the morning. We don't get high, we get numb. And so it numbs us out. And the, the, the numbness erases that. Lots of drinking. I've had drinking problems since. Not as bad as I used to, but I mean, we're talking, you were with me. I'd fucking black out like, what, three times a week sometimes? Because it works temporarily. You know, it's like I say to people, 
when you're drinking, you don't feel depressed. And they say, no. I said, well, you don't feel depressed till the next day. Now the depression becomes worse. Then finally, I, they got me for the court martial for having dirty urine. I was pretty much on my own. By the time I was 16, 17, I was working, going to school, and contributing at home, paying bills, buying groceries. It was a tough life. Uh, there was a lot of ebbs and flows, a lot of changes. You had to adapt, you had to move. And that's ultimately what led up to me joining the military in general. I'm Forrest Rosenbach. I'm a security and fire and life safety technician. I thought that it would be a good opportunity, you know, quid pro quo. I give them something, they give me something, and I come out better and bigger out of it. Boy, did that not happen. <laughs> Forrest, I met him. <laughs> I miss that guy. I don't know, he was just like, a, uh, he was a great friend of mine, and uh, he was in the infantry too. I think a lot of the issues that I had were not necessarily military-wise, but more of growing up-wise, being an, becoming an adult-wise. I mean, I was 17. I'd never had a bank account before. I'd never, any of that. I mean, I wrote a check while I was at Fort Campbell at a Walmart. They cashed it three weeks later, but I wasn't balancing a checkbook. I had no idea. So I spent that money. They had a hard time getting a hold of me. Warrant went out. I ended up getting arrested for it. Military police had to come get me for it. And it was dumb. I mean, just because I, I had no idea. Nobody, nobody taught me that. There was a health and welfare check on our barracks. I don't know why. It was our normal PT time. Instead, we went in formation in front of our barracks, and MPs and canines came through, and they walked through our barracks. What did they find? A wooden pipe with resin in it. <laughs> that was it. There was no weed. There was no nothing. It was just a little wooden pipe with resin in it in a backpack in my closet. Same thing with him. Piss tests and off to the world. Came in the form of notice that I was being court-martialed. Was there additional in instances after the pipe? No, just the one bad drug test, and that was it. Well, most people believe that the, the people get high. I use an analogy. If I did this to your big toe, how would you know it? And everybody said my toe would hurt, and I say no. It sends a, a message to your brain. Your brain knows it hurts, because if I wanted to remove your toe, I would anesthetize you and remove your toe, and you wouldn't know it. Well, that's what we're doing emotionally with the drugs and alcohol. I tried to go see people at Fort Campbell when I was there. Like, oh, you're fine. Yeah. Oh. All right. Fucking, I tried AA and all that stuff. Frickin', I don't know. I would love to go to the VA to find that out, but guess what? I did not serve honorably. I believe it was January of 2005 when my court martial happened, and I was sentenced to 60 days at Fort Knox Military Prison. And because I was taking anti-anxiety medication when I got to Fort Knox, they had to put me on suicide watch until a counselor or their social worker could come and visit with me and clear me. Of course, I got there on a Friday evening, and nobody was going to be there till Monday. So they put me in a cell with no blanket, no pillow, no amenities. They took all of my clothes, gave me a paper gown, and that was it. And that's how I was to be for the next 72 hours naked. Within like an hour, I was down to Tarzan, because every time you moved and, you know, you're trying to sit down, you're trying to figure out what you're going to do, it's rip, 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 falls off, fuck. It, it, it's comical now, like I can sit back and laugh at it now, but at the time it, it was fucking terrible. I mean, I had female guards that would come bring me food, my junk hanging out, I'm, and it's cold in there, so I, it's nothing to brag about. <laughs> and, uh, it was bad. It was not cool. Now the person becomes suicidal, has suicidal ideation, has suicidal thoughts. Not when they're not usually when they're drinking, because they're numb. That that anesthetizes them. VA recognizes that many veterans with less than honorable discharges have mental health issues that that may have precipitated the less than honorable discharge. Left there, went back to Fort Campbell for a bit, and gathered my things, stayed with Melanie for like a couple weeks, and then went home. Start to scratch. 
I've had a great career in pizza delivery since. <laughs> well, at the time, it sucked. Everything was war. I mean, it was 2005. I was trying to readjust to civilian life. And everywhere that I went to apply to, were you military? And then there'd be side notes with it that you have to answer this question. And so being 19 years old, because that's all I was at the time, 19, I, I'm applying at gas stations because that's the only place that I can get a job at because I have a bad conduct discharge now. They got the bad paper discharge. Now they didn't qualify anymore for the VA benefits. They, they, they got the discharge because of the PTSD that was untreated. Here 4,279, week two, day three. I'm in middle of Vermont at Quiche Farms. Uh, no, Quiche Inn and Marshland Farms. Uh, in kind of like the middle of Vermont. Woke up this morning for some early morning drone flights with all this fog. It's absolutely fantastic. Clearly I have not uh, made myself pretty yet, but you know, the story must go on. I'm at my most northeastern turnaround point, just outside of White River Junction. So far the trip has gone really, really well. I managed to block out the days that I needed pretty well. I got where I needed to be on time, and in general, it's been wildly successful. I even picked up a few interviews that I didn't have scheduled and I didn't have blocked out, but I got them. So it just adds to the story. You know, it was really, really nerve wracking for me to get into some of these conversations and situations with guys uh, that I haven't seen in about 15 years the anxiety of driving up to their house um, and re-engaging with them. You know, about five minutes after I got there, it was like we never, we never parted ways. Sergeant Vines, how's things going today? Uh, it's going outstanding, sir. Yeah? Just happy to be here. Meeting all the smiling faces. Oh, yeah. Wait a second. Here we go. Merhaba. <laughs> Merhaba. How are you? On a trip like this, and I'll, I'll pass 7,000 miles before the end of it, I'm at about 4,200 and something now. And I am just turning around to head back west. You know, you just gotta do it a mile at a time. I tried to pull over on a road that was quiet. And of course I pulled over on what seems to be the busiest road in the entire world. The light's perfect and it's beautiful outside right now as I am on the side of a Vermont road, but I am headed south uh, and west in the right direction. I got a bunch of interviews and stuff to still do on the way home, but at least I'm headed in that direction. So it's been two and a half weeks, mile marker 4,331, and uh, listen to some tunes, music up, windows down. Let's do this. You gotta do that first mile, and then do another mile after that, and make it to your first location, and just, repeat that process every day. And despite the fact of the anxiety or the self-doubt or the insecurities that I feel along the way, I just have to keep moving forward. And I have just gotten to take in some of the most absolute beauty of this country and everything that it has to offer. And you know, with that, I, I would just encourage anybody if they ever see my little vlogs here to, to go ahead and do that, to get out there, to take that first mile and uh, and just do it because we live in such a diverse nation that has such immense beauty that you're foolish if you don't get out there and, and, and see it for yourself. And don't fly, drive. From the helicopter when I was on fire pulling people through that fire, it felt like I was on fire. It felt like I had just burning inside of me. And when I came home, I just let that out. I told him I'm gonna be number 23. And the guy pointed to the door and said, half the people in the waiting room feel the same way. Basically like, you ain't special. What was harder almost? Was war harder or was coming home harder? Because in your mind, when you come home, everything was still as you left it. But people have moved on and you know, lives have changed over that year. And when you come home, it's just, you still think that you're a year back almost. I had no, no transition. It was basically like dropping me out into the wild almost, you know? When you take, especially an, an infantry soldier um, with the 101st Airborne, and especially the Rockasons, and you just drop them out into the civilian world with 
not even a couple days or a week to adjust, it's a hard adjustment for sure. Um, State Senator Dalen Leach, 17th Senatorial District, Montgomery and Delaware County. I'm not your standard senator. That is one of the things I least want to be in the world. I got so many veterans coming to me and saying variations of, I was in Iraq, I was in Vietnam, I was in Afghanistan. I have post-traumatic stress disorder. I've been medicated with, you know, clonopin and Ativan and all these other drugs, and I feel like a zombie all the time, and I'm self-medicating with alcohol, and I feel suicidal, and I just don't feel like a human being anymore. I did the VA for a while, and all they did was just medicate. That's what their cure was, their cure. I could fill trash bags with the bottle they would send. Just send it in the mail, in the mail, in the mail. As a country, we need to be open to all kinds of different things that can help our veterans. Because right now, we're not doing what we need to do for them. That was their, their fix all, basically. And if this one doesn't work, then take this one. If that doesn't work, take two of these. We have such an epidemic of veteran suicides uh, in this country, in part because of the post-traumatic stress disorder. Any kind of alternative treatment, if we study it out in an unbiased way and, and results are there, then we should we should let people try it. I mean, instead of filling 10 bottles, why don't you give them a little bit of marijuana? This may not work for everybody. Nothing works for everybody. But if this can have a, a dramatic impact on these veterans, I mean, I don't understand how anyone could deny them something that would help them. It helps with A, B, C, D, E, and E. You don't have to take five pills for that. Someone told me recently that pot and PTSD is like the Wild West. We don't know. Uncharted territory. So are there benefits from it? And I, I think we're still out on that. But I don't think we ought to take all this off the table until we know where we're going with it. So I, I get it. But I'm just thinking broad therapeutic potential. We need to better standardize the delivery of the medications. And so the issue of whether people should get high is a separate issue. I'm definitely not able to comment on that. I just think we need to explore uh, like manufactured drugs. We are breeding CBD hemp here and growing CBD hemp here to reach out to the wide population for medical benefits. Because it's non-psychoactive, it's more widely accepted. Most people think of cannabis plants as having psychoactive properties, which are not something the general public wants to deal with. I'm Sean Stockmeyer, president of New Earth Biosciences. We process industrial hemp into extracts and derivatives. We basically extract the CBD from the industrial hemp, concentrate it to pharmaceutical grade CBD. Once we take the hemp out of the field, here it goes to a separate facility where it's getting dried, cured, and then from there it goes to an extraction facility where it is being turned into CBD concentrates. One of the things that does really well for veterans that are coming back with PTSD is it helps relieve anxiety. It really calms them down, it quiets their brain. Hundreds of them have either in the phone or in personal meetings or in letters or in emails communicated to me that this has been a lifesaver to them. And they are doing it illegally. And they're, they're risking all kinds of things. So it just keeps raining. This is the second hurricane I've had to deal with on this trip. And the stress that I was feeling this morning is just kind of really gone through the roof at this point. This morning I'm stressed. I got a long road ahead of me. I got a lot of stops. I got another, looks like week and a half before I'll make it back to California. My wife is stressed. If I haven't mentioned it by now, I have a pregnant wife at home and she is done with me being gone. And with almost a full three weeks into the trip and I just made the turnaround point, I had to call her and tell her that one of my interviews, my last and most important interview with Dr. Sue Sicily just got pushed back from a Friday to a Monday, extending the trip an additional three days. And now I gotta deal with this rain. I don't know. I'm just really starting to question what the point of this is. So.
uh, mile marker 4,701. I know when Jesse got busted, he had a very small closet grow. It was not a big grow. It was, a, it was basically just a little closet space. The suspects, 27-year-old Jesse Snyder and 28-year-old Justin Erty, face felony drug charges. Officers responded to a call of shots fired Saturday at a party at a home on County Road 400 South. Tholen says the officers found a marijuana growing operation, more than 30 grams of plants. I wish that there could be a more uniform law with regard to things like what is available for patients who need it. And perhaps if he had had access to that medicine in Indiana, he would have never ended up in the situation where he ended up. He couldn't get hired at a good job like the post office anymore because the charge is still pending. And even after the charges were dismissed, people are like, well, we're not going to hire you. Several months later, I, he told me that he lost the house that he had just bought. That's where I saw the the start of the, I don't know, downward spiral, I guess. And it was just horrible for him, just fucking terrible. And kind of never got back on track, at which point I think he had moved to California. He's just doing the Californian thing, what Californians do, they chill out and grow pot, but he was nothing like I'd ever seen him before. He was on a lot of stuff, we're talking like, he was sucking on fentanyl patches at one point. He, he definitely was a little bit different. Um, it was kind of hard to put your finger on exactly what it was, whether it was just, you know, wartime experience or something else, I think. I, can't, I think Steve called me and said he got a call from one of his friends in California that said, hey, I just took Jesse to the hospital. He was dying on his floor or something. He had, he had overdosed on something. I think it turned out later it might have been fentanyl patches that he got from the VA. It just sucks seeing him like that. He was literally just like everything, fucking pain pills and whatnot. The last time I saw him, he was, he looked skinnier than I remembered him. And a lot more drinking too. I mean, he always drank, but it's mixing that with like fentanyl patches and shit and bad. I uh, got a phone call from his brother, and and I had company at the time, and I, I did not take the call. I was actually here at Steve's house. And a moment later, he called back again, which gave me a pretty bad feeling of apprehension. Jake was calling back. He looked at his phone, looked at me, and went outside to answer it. That call was, I suppose, not the greatest surprise I've ever experienced, which, which breaks my heart to say. Steve was outside for a few minutes. And he comes back in the door and just looks at me and waits for me to come outside. A while later, we hear that he died. I don't know how. I don't know why. I think they found him like on the side of the road, and he was just laying there. I don't know if he overdosed. I don't know. Well, uh, at the time, Steve was notified. Uh, basically, he said he, you know, they found him on the street. That they don't know what happened. And a week later, they think it's an overdose. Don't know. Think about him every day. I, I don't think I would still trade it because of the fact that I love this guy and his family so much from growing up with them. You know, they were always genuine people to me, and. And I think in the end, that's what I'm gonna, I'm gonna cherish. So I still visit Jesse at his grave. I go back and I swing through the cemetery because it's out in my neck of the woods. And I stop by and say, you dumbass, man, I miss you. Fuck. Now this is what I remember Indiana being like. Yeah. Flat, flat cornfields and whatever else they grow here. Mainly corn. Turn left onto West 660 South, then your destination will be on the right. It's a redstone. I know that. I guess we should just get out and look. Take that 
side, I'll take this side. Jesse passed away in March 2014. Um, he lived, came from here in uh, Lafayette, Indiana. He moved to California, we think, because he wanted to grow weed. But uh, I moved to California about the same time. And when I got out there, he called me. I was supposed to go up and meet up with him, but I didn't <clears throat> because uh, Danielle flew into town and I have a voicemail from him that I've been saving for about two and a half years. It's from 2014, from Jesse. I haven't listened to it yet. It's only 12 seconds long. I know what it says, though. So it's gonna say, hey, fucker, what are you doing? Call me back. I know this one's good. So here we go. Put the speaker on. <laughs> and that's ironic. Nothing there. Nothing there. No, it is. Hold on. My speaker is not working. Later. What's this? I didn't think it was there. Speaker on. Hey, fuckhead, I know you're awake. Uh, just give me a ballpark of when you got to be rolling this way. Well, I swear to see you, bro. Later. Start with hey, I knew it. This is what he always called me, you know? Oh, I was worried that there wasn't anything there. I know I started with hey, cheese dick. Cheese stick? Yeah, fewer fucker has cheese stick. <laughs> I'm so glad that I was there. I'm gonna listen to it again. Hey, fuckhead, I know you're awake. Uh, give me a ballpark when you're gonna be rolling this way. Look for the scene, bro. Later. I didn't go see Jesse that weekend because Danielle came. Um, when I called him and told him I couldn't come, I could hear it in him that he broke that he's just like, that was it. He was already in a really bad place. John had told me, his family has told me, his friends had told me. <sighs> he always was invincible, wasn't he? Well, uh, <sighs> I'm gonna say goodbye to you, Jesse. Been waiting till now. We'll regroup one day. Definitely. Bahala. Until we form again, my friend. Until we form again. <laughs> Travel vlog, mile marker almost 6,000. I don't really know. My brain is fried. My body's like fried. I feel like I'm melting into a sack of inefficiency. I have like 1,100 miles to drive to Denver, which is the second to last stop before I'm done with this insane trip. And uh, I'm gonna try to get there in one day, but uh, 1,100 miles in one day, yeah, makes my melted brain hurt even more. Whew. All right, we're in like the final half of this trip. Final 25%, so half of a half, all the way back west. Fuck! Often when we're considering legislation that other states have passed, 
important legislation, we go to those states and see what's going on. On the same logic, we went out to Colorado to understand what, what the industry actually looks like on the ground. It's one thing to read an article, it's another thing to actually go and touch things and talk to people who are doing it. My name is Irene Aguilar, I'm a state senator representing Southwest Denver's District 32. I'm Adam Foster, I'm a lawyer at Hoban Law Group. My name is Cody Keto. I was a sergeant, served in OEF-8 Afghanistan. One of the things people say is, well, we can't legalize it because, yeah, yeah, you, you, what you smoked in the 70s is nothing like, it's totally different now, it's much more potent, it's a whole different drug. So I wanted to see if that was true. So we smoked some, and I tweeted that, and within half an hour, suddenly I got 30 calls from the New York Times, B, uh, BBC, CNN, everyone, because I was the first incumbent legislator who admitted smoking in our history. Prior to being a state senator, I worked as a primary care doctor for Denver Health and Hospitals for 23 years. I will admit that I came into the legislatures thinking that, boy, you know, we just legalized medical marijuana so people could get marijuana. At the time, the VA had said that if people were using cannabis consistent with their own state's medical marijuana laws, then their VA benefits would not be in danger. But in Colorado, you could not use cannabis because PTSD had not been recognized as a, as a qualifying condition. And that meeting some patients whose lives have really been changed by using medical marijuana has shown me that there are people for whom this really is the drug of choice. There was a grave concern that they could put their VA benefits in jeopardy by, by using medical marijuana. That really was the, the point of the suit to allow veterans and other folks suffering from PTSD to be able to obtain the recommendation for cannabis from their treating physician and to have their use of cannabis evaluated by the doctor in terms of a comprehensive treatment plan. Where they can get what we look for in medicine, which is decreased symptoms, improved function with minimal side effects. The first thing that happened when we came home was uh, one of our, I believe he's a, an all-wheel mechanic, uh, Bridgewater, he killed himself in his vehicle with, like, with a note and everything, like one of the first weekends we were home. And uh, that hit deep and we were all like, holy fuck, like that shit was crazy. But it kept happening like amongst the, our units. Finally, about four or five months later, it hit home like real hard with us. And it was such a weird scenario. Like he was already sleeping. Uh, he came up out of his bed and he got out of bed, like got his, got his pistol out and he just walked into the living room. The look in his eyes, like it was just like such a weird scenario and especially the way that he was acting. And he pointed the gun like at all of us kind of like in a sweeping direction, like in a manner that he wouldn't normally do. And my reaction at the time was like, dog, don't, don't flash us with that gun, man. That shit is loaded. Travis looked at both of us kind of like, uh, it's not loaded or like he didn't believe us or something and just stuck the gun to the back of his ear and pulled the trigger. I was a gunner, didn't have a strap down, got ejected from the turret, took a turret shield to the face, uh, knocked out like a good quarter-sized chunk of my jaw. I was in an accident in Hawthorne, Nevada. We had seven men die and eight men injured in a mortar accident up there. I was infantry, but I was basically the liaison between the guys on the ground and the intel guys. So I went out on every patrol with my guys, and anytime uh, you know, I, I'd do evidence collection, I would uh, identify enemy KIA. I was in Ramadi, uh, Iraq in 2008, and then I was in Afghanistan uh, in Treknawa with Hunter and Brandon in uh, 2010. Got out with a TBI, spinal injuries, cervical, thoracic, and lumbosacral. I had partial paralysis, numbness, and uh, they, they had me on a lot of drugs. When I first got back, I was trouble. 
I didn't know what to do with myself. I didn't have purpose. I'd get in a lot of fights. I was pretty mean. I was in therapy at least once a week. I was doing physical therapy a couple times a week as well. Heck, I was on Oxycontin, uh, 160 milligrams a day. I was on Roxycodone for breakthrough pain. That was about 60 milligrams a day. Oxycontin and Oxycodone, they were stacked. Uh, one, my Oxycontin was like a long-term release, and then my Oxycodone was a smaller dose, but quick release throughout the day. Also, morphine, 30 milligrams. I was given a, a benzo. I, I think it was um, lorazepam. Also, two benzodiazepines at the same time as I was on all these other uh, opiates. I was having like anger outbursts, and they just wanted to kind of like numb me out. Valium for muscle spasticity because of the spinal injuries, and uh, Xanax for the PTSD attacks. It did quite the opposite. Like I wasn't in control of myself, and I wasn't able to remember things. I would black out. Like it was a, it was a pretty intense drug. I didn't even know my name most days. I, I literally was uh, either you know screaming at the ceiling or, or falling asleep in the middle of my sentences. Uh, there was no in between. It was uh, I didn't know whether I was coming or going. It was it was hell. It was absolute hell on earth. Once I came out here, I kind of let go of all of that. I got off all the prescription medications. I'm from upstate New York, and when I first ETS, I went back to upstate New York, and I was a criminal for smoking, for grow for cultivating, for any sort of um, extraction process, because then that's a controlled substance. Holy shit, you know what I mean? And then we're talking huge felonies. When I would have my anger outbursts, I would immediately jump to taking that pill. And smoking cannabis for me was like a recreational thing. You know, I, I wouldn't think like, oh, I'm really fired up right now. I actually gotta smoke a bowl. I had a friend, um, old friend, uh, and he suggested to me that hey, have you tried this? You know, I, I've read some stuff and maybe it'll help. I don't know, maybe it won't. And uh, I was kind of volatile at the time and I was just like, what? You know, like, you want me to add another psychotropic medication, a, a dr an illegal drug, you know, on top of everything I'm already on. I'm, I, I'm, no. But once I did substitute that, I did find that it was extremely helpful. As soon as legalization popped out here in Colorado, I was like, you know, like that's where I need to be. I can't be considered a criminal just for medicating myself properly because other people think it's wrong. And he was like, I'm not your doctor. You don't have to ever do it again if you don't like it. And no one, no doctor had ever said that to me. It's always like, you have to take this. And if you come in and you pee in a cup and you don't have this in your system, you get yanked off of all your you know, your support, your benefits, all that stuff. Nobody had ever said, hey, it's your choice. You can do whatever you want. You can be your own doctor. You can just give it a shot. You can try it. And I did. I sat there, I waited. I was like, well, is it gonna do anything? And the next thing I knew, I was lost in a daydream. I moved to uh, Lakewood, Colorado. I go to school here now. I grow my own cannabis. I'm not considered a criminal. I essentially replaced five Five pharmaceuticals of cannabis. And I hadn't been lost in a daydream, just a simple daydream for four years, maybe. But my brain recognized what had just happened. And it was just like, oh my God, you just had five minutes of peace, like complete and utter peace. So the bill has been signed by the governor. He took until the last day he could sign it to sign it, so it is now effective in our state. So what that means is that if you have a diagnosis of PTSD, you can see a medical provider and they can authorize you for a medical marijuana card to use marijuana for your PTSD. People who are against the bill would say, well, well this is just anecdotal evidence, right? And, and so you would have all these people telling really compelling stories like our plaintiffs about how you know, from their perspective, medical cannabis literally saved their lives. Nothing had worked. They were, they were thinking about it in their own life. They found this. That was the life preserver that allowed them to kind of reintegrate into, into society and to lead normal lives. So, you know, when you hear someone look you in the eye and tell you that, that's pretty compelling stuff. When the opponents are looking at it, I mean, they can't really say, well, you're wrong. You know, I mean, that's someone's own experience. It's their own story. 
Uh, and so a lot of the time they would say, but that's just anecdotal evidence. It's not, not somehow real science. When you have PTSD, when you get so numb, you, you don't really have a lot of pleasant experiences, right? So I, I get it, but I'm just thinking broad therapeutic potential, we need to better standardize the delivery of the medications. You know, they make glaring the side effects of marijuana, that the person won't have ambition, that long term they lose memory, they, they can uh, develop paranoia. We, we know that. The jury's out. A lot more research is needed on marijuana and PTSD. In Colorado, if we collect money from the people for a specific purpose, we need to use it for that purpose. When many more patients signed up for medical marijuana than we anticipated, we found that we had too many funds in our medical marijuana cash fund. And so about two years ago, we passed a bill um, and had our Department of Public Health and Environment create a scientific advisory committee that actually is funding some research projects on the medical use of marijuana in our state. And so one of the projects we funded with Dr. Sue Sisley is on PTSD and marijuana. Suzanne Sisley, who's a psychiatrist based out of, of Scottsdale, received a $2 million grant from the Colorado Department of Public Health and the Environment, uh, the CDPHE, to study the effect of smoked cannabis in military veterans with PTSD. She is in the process of implementing that study. And so, Hopefully in the next few years, we'll be getting the data we need to support these anecdotal and, and story case stories that we're seeing of people doing so much better. My relationship with the veteran community started about 20 years ago when I first met them at the Phoenix VA hospital. I was immediately enchanted with this group. I just, I love their candor, you know, the bluntness was really resonated with me. and. And they quickly became my favorite patients. Like these were the patients, even when I went into private practice, that I looked forward to be seeing the most each day it was my veterans. So uh, my name is Sue Sicily. I'm an MD. I practice internal medicine and psychiatry, and I'm the principal investigator over this clinical trial here. This, this lab, we're doing a, a triple-blind, randomized controlled trial looking at military veterans that have treatment-resistant PTSD and evaluating the safety and efficacy of four different varieties of whole plant cannabis that we've purchased from the federal government, and then seeing how the military veterans respond to this treatment. Do we just have to constantly pummel these veterans with the same old antidepressants that have a clear black box warning on them that this could increase suicidal thinking? Do we have to just continually put them through the gauntlet of all these, you know, addictive, sedating, psychotropic medications? Or could we, you know, think broadly and think about other botanical medicines that might provide benefit to the veteran community? It's a drug like anything else, so there are risks and benefits, right? I don't want to give you the impression that I'm pro-cannabis because I'm, I'm really just pro-research and I believe that this plant deserves to be studied in a rigorous, controlled environment. So later on when we unlock the database and unblind all the data, we'll be able to analyze all of that and get more insight into how people reacted to these different samples. Now that I'm seeing patients firsthand using the study drug day to day, I'm starting to wonder why we've so severely restricted this plant. We've criminalized it at every turn. It really may not be warranted. Travel vlog, mile marker 7311. I'm in Utah at Arch National Park, Arches National Park at sunrise. Just about killed myself to get up here. So did a couple other people. Absolutely beautiful morning. And guess what? I realized I only got two days left of this ridiculous adventure. Pretty happy. 700 miles, I'll be home. Oh my God. That's
These are the girls. Recently found out that they were all girl, which is fantastic. For me, I mean, having come from the army and having gotten in trouble and busted for smoking pot in the army, that really opened my door to fighting to make this innocent plant something that people aren't going to go to jail for. They're not going to lose their kids for. They're not going to uh, lose everything that they've worked for and worked very hard for. Not anymore. Not like I did, not like my father had, not like millions of other people around the world and in America especially, um, veterans and non alike. Hopefully in 10, 20 years, the idea that people were even given tickets for smoking cannabis would be ridiculous. And yes, I do feel very vindicated seeing more than half the country adopt uh, medical marijuana and to see uh, astonishing polls that are showing 60 plus percent support for cannabis legalization across the states. Um, I feel very vindicated. For lack of better words, we're trigger pullers in the infantry. I found out really fast that no one really cared about that skill set. I had a, one of my buddies that started the company with me actually was turned down from a warehouse job because he was overqualified. And all he wanted to do was sweep floors for $9 an hour. My name is Hunter Garth. I'm the managing director of Iron Protection Group. From our perspective, we thought, hey, look, we have this skill set and we don't believe it's being done right in cannabis. And from there, that ideology took off. I started Iron Protection Group with a few guys I served with. We kind of built it up into this robust security company that hires veterans. I remember doing field ops with Hunter a lot, and Hunter was always talking about IPG, you know, about this veteran contracting style company. And Hunter actually did it. We started to see our own success with dealing with PTSD or dealing with the issues of transitioning out of the Marine Corps um, and recognized that it was solely about us having something to do, being passionate, and being around each other, uh, probably most importantly. Well, right now we're expanding out to California. Uh, we have an office open in Sacramento, and then we'll be shortly opening one in LA. We're looking at a bunch of different markets across the country as they come online. My favorite thing about this organization is that I'm working with my boys and that we're, you know, guarding cannabis. It just kind of fell into place and guys started finding a home and finding purpose and in turn the business grew. You know, not only being a large company, but being able to help out veterans every day and like, it's a pretty cool feeling in all honesty. With everything that Hunter's got going on here, he's helping a lot of people, he's helping a lot of veterans, but Hunter couldn't have done that if he hadn't helped himself first. So I believe that the most important aspect of facing PTSD is really finding the purpose within a group, right? Finding a tribe setting where, they, where you're needed every single day, where you love the people around you and the people around you love you. And that is the perfect setting for not being depressed for what it's worth. That's what we're doing here. That's, that's our direct goal. And that's by far the most positive thing you can do for a veteran with PTSD. The overarching theme that I've try to put out there is purpose and like find your purpose and really drive for that you know like fall in love with that purpose like really push towards that looking inward and really trying to clean up your act looking inward and, and trying to be a better person I think if you're doing that every day you can't go wrong there. today is the end of the fourth week the 28th day I crashed early last night, didn't make it as far as I wanted to, was to sleep by 7, and woke up this morning at like 5.30, a little bit earlier than usual, just with this renewed sense of ability and gratitude for sure was a lot of it. And of course the realization that this thing's almost over. It's only a six hour drive from Phoenix to LA, and my wife and my baby are waiting for me and I'm ready to get there. I am, uh, I can see how I've been like fogged up by this and my mind hasn't been able to get past this, this block because I've, I've been focused, so task oriented on this project that, you know, boy, 
I started thinking about writing a letter to my future son or daughter. I don't even know what it is yet today about, you know, things that I want them to know coming into this world, things that I, as, as the father, would like them to learn, maybe some guidelines. Um, and it was extremely overwhelming. I broke down uh, into tears with just a sense of amazing possibility. So that's it. I'm gonna get a good meal in me. I'm gonna take a shower, put on some clean clothes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna knock this out. I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs>